your host for this series of our Regenerative Future Season 2, Otato Nahiri, our forest, produced by Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust. For these webisodes, we're really grateful for the collaboration of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. This year, Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust are exploring the role of native forests as a source of natural, spiritual and economic value. Through these conversations, we hope that we will get people thinking about the potential of native forests as a source of regenerative and restorative economic and spiritual and natural gain. And in today's webinar, we'll be looking at the question of land. The Climate Change Commission has proposed that New Zealand plants 300,000 hectares of new native forest by 2035. Pure Advantage has gone even further, suggesting 1 million hectares of new native forest is achievable. That sounds great. Who doesn't want more native forest in New Zealand? Well, the question is, where would this land come from? Is it the so-called marginal land that's located on the steep and unfriendly slopes of some New Zealand farms? Will it come from expanding our conservation estate? Or will it come from new commercial forests that might supplement or even replace some of our exotic commercial forests? To discuss this VEX question, I'm joined by a panel of three experts. Professor David Norton from Takura Nahiri, the School of Forestry at the University of Canterbury. Adele Fitzpatrick, Chief Executive of Project Crimson and Trees That Count. And James Treadwell, the President of New Zealand Institute of Forestry. Soon I'm going to let these fine folk introduce themselves, but just a bit of housekeeping first. We're happy to take your questions if you use the Q&A uh, form on Zoom. And also check that chat window because we will be um, adding information and links and responding to as many questions as we can. Uh, it, this is a forum, so um, your involvement is really important for us. There's a ton of great material on our website, which uh, you can find at pureadvantage.org. And you can follow us on all the socials on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And of course, we'll be back again next Tuesday with another episode. So to our guests, uh, I'm going to invite our three guests to just give us a very quick summary of who they are, what they do, and why native forests mean something to them. And perhaps, uh, Adele, we could start with you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, I'm Adele Fitzpatrick. I'm the Chief Executive of Project Crimson Trust, and we run uh, the Trees That Count program, which um, hopefully you've heard of. Um, native forestry and, and trees, every tree, every tree counts, is incredibly important to me. Uh, and our trust, um, Project Crimson, is 30 years old. It was started from uh, the need to save the Purtakawa, which was almost extinct, which you know most people um, are surprised to hear about. Uh, so we are very uh, engaged in helping all of New Zealand to um, to be actively in, involved in um, planting native native trees and uh, restoring our forestry. Well, thank you, Adele. Uh, James, who are you and what do you do? Uh, kia ora everyone and good evening. Um, I am James Treadwell and I am the President of the Institute of Forestry. Um, that is basically the professional body of, uh, of foresters. So we have uh, approximately 900 members um, and increasing rapidly. Uh, we look at um, forests as they, all forests, so um, exotic as well as native, and obviously have a pretty major concern about the emphasis on exotic at the moment over native. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Great. Vincent. Thank you. Um, David, same. Well, thanks, Vincent. Tell, yeah, tell us who you are and, and, and why do native forests mean, yeah. what do they mean to you? Thank you and kia ora everybody. Um, I work at the University of Canterbury in, in Te Kura Nahiri, the School of Forestry there, and I've spent my whole life um, working and recreating in, in our native forests. Um, I feel very passionate about native forests. 
um, and I enjoy sharing them with with our students and um, and also doing research and 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 just being involved in native forest and of course uh, tramping is my passion so as a family we spend a lot of time walking through native forest too. Um, I guess my big interest these days is very much around restoring native forest, bringing native forest back and particularly working with um, landowners in rural New Zealand with farmers in terms of managing the remnants they have and trying to increase the area of native forests. Thanks, Vincent. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you and welcome, everybody. And, and thank you, uh, our, our, uh, our audience, for joining us today. I think we've got some good numbers, so I look forward to the discuss, this discussion. David, I want to start with you, actually. You know, the, the Tane's Tree Trust has identified something like a million hectares of land that's on this steep, erosion-prone, sometimes called marginal land. That seems like a a really good place to start planting native forests. What what do you think of uh, targeting that land for this effort of planting native forest? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, Vincent. And I think um, it's not as simple as just saying, well, let's put it all on marginal land because because what does marginal land mean um, from a from a from both from a forest point of view from what we want from our forests and and from the perspective of the farmer whose land we're talking about and I think we need to recognize that land that we regard as, as marginal often is an important part of a farm in the sense that it might be used uh, at particular times of the year for example during drought periods or something like that so it can still be critical for the farming operation even though it isn't the most productive part of the farm mm -hmm. but I think more importantly than that it's not the it's not the amount of forest we plant and, and putting it on those those those, those so-called marginal areas it's where we put the forest that's important and it's really thinking about well, what's already in the landscape you know how can we add trees into that landscape to maximize biodiversity values to maximize cultural values how can we improve connectivity and yes marginal land may well be part of that but there'll be other parts of the landscape that are just as important and we, we really need to be putting trees into those areas as well so to me it's not as simple as just saying there's a million hectares of marginal land that's planted up to me it's more about saying well where, where are the best places to put those trees to get the best outcomes for biodiversity and, and for New Zealand as a whole. Uh, Tane's Tree Trust also has this phrase right tree right place mm. uh, do you want to just explain that? Well, well, definitely. I mean, you know, you 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 you'd plant a, a species that that grows well on difficult sites, on difficult sites. We should plant a species that 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 responds to fertility on fertile sites. So it's really thinking about what 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 are the ecological attributes of the site, and then making sure that the trees that go into that site are the right trees for that site. And clearly, that's driven by rainfall. It's driven by um, it's driven by um, altitude, it's driven by soil fertility, and it's, it's, it's really getting the best outcome. I mean, if we plant the right trees and, and, and the sites they're suited to, we'll get the fastest growth, we'll get the best forest, we'll, we'll get the best outcome for biodiversity. I'm going to put you on the spot and say, if you did target this so-called marginal land, and, you know, I realise that's, that's a controversial word to say, because... You know, what is marginal? But yeah. let's say you're targeting... Well, no, no, no land is marginal, really. I mean, it's, it, all land's got a value. Yeah, yeah, sure. But realistically, could you could you fix on a number of, of the amount of hectares that you think is available for planting natives uh, instead, I suppose, instead of pastoral farming? Um, again, I'm not going to fix on a number because I think it depends on the way that that land is being used now and the way it can be used in the future. So if that land is just being used for biodiversity conservation, it's got a different value than say if it's being used for sustainable timber production as well as biodiversity conservation yeah. or for carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. So it will depend on, on how the land's going to be used and what, what the values are associated with that and how the person whose land it's on um, values those, those different things. Mm -hmm. Adele, um, in your efforts to find uh, plant planters, what do you call them? Planters? Um, planters, both, yes, forest, planting, forest, groups, uh, planting landowners, groups, yeah. planting groups, yeah. I'm not even sure planters is a word, but anyway. Um, yeah. wh where are they finding pockets of land to plant these many trees, 700,000 trees, I think you, you uh, have already um purchased uh, and planted. Uh, are there particular parts of the country that are getting more um, concentration of effort from trees that count? 
Yeah, so Tree Set Count is currently working with planting projects or planters. Let, let, let's let's call that a real word, Vincent. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, across the country, and uh, and they range from uh, community groups working on public land, or landowners, or um, iwi groups, or schools. You know, so there's a whole range of projects. Um, and there, we, we work with seven, uh, around 730 uh, different projects around the country, different sizes. Um, and, and they go from, let's say, 500 trees to 5,000 trees. So they are small pockets at the moment. Um, and they are really important because they are the trees that are popping up in our communities and that we get to experience generally within public land. Uh, and that is great because it's within our neighbourhoods, within our communities. Um, we work with a lot of farmers as well who are very active in restoring their land and, their, um, and protecting their waterways and who have a, a real connection with the land, as I, as I believe most farmers do. You know, they connect with the land. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity there to, um, to be going bigger uh, and to be operating at scale. Uh, and, and the question now is, well, how do we expand all of this? If you were, didn't expand, if you worked with the current regime and the, the, I suppose, the speed of planting that you're doing now, how long would it take you to get to 300,000 hectares? Is, it, is that even possible? Yeah, I think it probably is possible. You know, we are only limited at the moment by our funding. So we have, um, so we run a, Trees that Count is basically a two-sided marketplace. We take in funding for native trees, and then we match that funding with planters who apply for the trees. Um, we have uh, many more planters applying for trees than we do funders. So that tells me that we could double what we are doing easily next year. So the land is there, the willingness is there, the planters are there, the people who are wanting to do the hard mahi, that they're all there, they are just, they're waiting. And if I could double our income into our marketplace, then I could meet that, meet that need. Um, and let's say we, you know, trees that count, we've been operating for three or four years now. Every year we double year on year. So if we continue to do that, um, then, you, you know, really we could satisfy um, a large part of, uh, of New Zealand's requirements. Um, not so much the, the larger scale, that, that is more of the, you know, to, to the up to 5,000 trees type of scale. But if we were going to go beyond that, that's a different story. Just do some maths for me. Maybe uh, I'm no good at maths, Vincent. No, <laughs> I do words, not numbers. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy for anyone to answer this question. Um, how... You've, you've planted 700,000 trees. What would that translate into numbers of hectares? What's the density uh, we could expect realistically? Okay, this is, this is an easy calculation for you, and I do have a calculator handy. And if we go on the, the kind of rough calculation of, let's say, 3,000 stems per hectare, so that's, what, 700 uh, divided by 3,000... That's what, that's only, you know, that's really, that's only, say, 230 hectares. Hmm. Long way to go. Very to, long way to go. To get Very to 300,000. So, <laughs> so, so to get there, you know, the implication, um, James, is that we need commercial in scale, industrial scale planting to get to 300,000. Does, does that sound right to you? I mean, does, does, does 300,000 hectares sound like a big number to you as a commercial forester? Um, of native planting, yeah, 300,000 yes. is quite a lot. That is quite a lot. It's, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking 10,000 hectares a year if we want to meet the Climate Change Commission's um, targets. And I've heard people throw around a million, a million hectares. That's 100,000 hectares a year. That's half of Kaimgaroa. Now, Kangaroo is the largest man-made forest in the southern hemisphere, so it's a lot. It's a lot of trees to be planting. Um, I you, sorry, do you just qual qualify that, James. Do, are you saying half the Kangaroo every year, or half in its entirety? Every like, year, if you're looking for a million. Crikey! 
Three hundred thousand is bigger than Kaikoura, so let's put that in perspective. So yeah, it's a big it's a big area of land that we're looking at. Um, and I, I agree with Adele that it's possible, um, but it's not possible to sit there and say we're going to just put it in one area, or we just. And I agree, I agree with um, David as well in terms of saying let's put it on. Uh, you know, it's all on marginal land. That's not going to happen. We have to look at all land. We have to look at riversides. We have to look at urban. We have to look everywhere if we're going to get to the number that we're talking about. Um, now, professional foresters can help with that, um, but you know our job is to is to make sure the trees grow and that they are um, and that they are managed well and looked after well and they survive the period to get to maturity. Um, where the land's coming from is a different kettle of fish altogether, and that's a that's a conversation that New Zealand has to have. We've we've had. We, we in New Zealand look at land very uh, strangely. We look at land and say, I bought a title of land and that title is going into dairy or that title is going into forestry or that title is going into grapes rather than saying what part of it can go into dairy, what part of it can go into forestry, what part of it goes into grapes, kiwi fruit. And that's a conversation we need to be starting to have. Mm. I think, Vincent, can I throw a comment in there as well? Please do. I think, you know, that the issue of meeting 300,000 hectares or a million hectares, it doesn't have to all be new planting. We've got so much regenerating vegetation in New Zealand. We've got, you know, extensive areas of Karnaka and Manaka of mixed broadleaf regeneration. We've got extensive areas of gorse and, and, and European broom um, coming back with, with mixed natives in them. And those, those areas are hugely potent, have huge potential. And, and I think with really good sort of strategic enrichment planting, they can be moved more rapidly towards a, a more mature condition. And, and those areas, we, we shouldn't, you know, I think when we talk about planting trees, we've got to actually take a step back. And first of all, we've got to say, well, what do we already have? We already have like in, in lowland rural New Zealand, you know, large areas of remnant forest, often previously cut over or, or degraded by, by domestic or feral grazing mm. animals, mm. that's incredibly valuable. We've got large areas of regenerating forests for a variety of reasons, particularly removal of subsidies back in the 80s, but other reasons as well. There's a lot of regenerating forest and we've got restoration plantings. And we, we can't look at one of them, restoration plantings in isolation from the other two, because they're all they're all connected and 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 we need to be thinking about how they all work and how we work them together. And and yes, there are some areas where we really need new restoration plantings. There are other areas where there's really good regen going on, but at the same time we should be looking after what's already there. And we need to think about all of this at a landscape scale. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. It's not blanketing a hundred thousand hectares in one block in, in, in native forest, it's actually thinking where can we get the best outcome for biodiversity, for, for cultural values, and, and how can we build on what we already have? I suppose the great thing about having a number is it sets a target, right? And and if the, if the vision is to expand our native forest estate, wouldn't having a number like 300,000 or a million uh, be kind of part of our ambition and it's a bit like saying we want to be carbon neutral by 2050 you know why not 2051 or 2049 you know you need a you need a number to set some sort of agenda yeah i think a number's good as long as we don't lose sight of yeah. the other things that are out there so i would hate to see us become so preoccupied with planting 300,000 hectares we don't think about working with the farmers to help them manage what they've already got on their land, for example. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's actually more important, um, looking after what we already have, and then restoration comes next. So I think it's it's got to be both. both but yeah, I mean, the targets are good for sure, yeah. Can I add into that as well? I mean, I totally agree with David. And I worry about numbers because numbers actually some drive results we don't want. Um, and I'll throw it out there. We look at the billion tree target at the moment that's out there. And there are trees, from my view, that are going onto in, onto land that should not be being put into trees, into exotic, because they are, I don't know what they're going to look like in 100 years' time. It's going to be a mess. So that's the problem with targets. So i um, happy to have a target, but let's, let's have the conversation about where we put these trees. And from my point of view, we need to spread it out as well for, for multiple reasons. I mean, for streaming, to, to make sure our water quality is up to standard is one reason for that, but also so, so that our native species can actually disperse across the landscapes. If you look at my hometown of, of Hawke's Bay, there's not much native on the plains there and um, the birds struggle, simple. Yeah, I've, and if I can jump in there too, you know, um, 
as terrible as I am with numbers, you know, our key program is trees that count and uh, numbers it, do. It's a hint. They, it's a hint. Yeah. There's a there's a hint in the name there, Adele, about there what is, your yeah, job is. There is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I need to learn how to count. Uh, but you know, every tree. You know, let's look at those individual trees that are going in in our neighbourhoods and um, in our communities. And it's not just about blanket um, blanket planting. Uh, if we do not have regeneration, and I support absolutely everything that um, that David and, and James have been saying. Um, but, you know, it's important that we have the incentives right. So if we have this target, what are the incentives that are in place to help us get to that target? And that's when I like a target. It's only if the incentives are right that help us to get there. All right. Well, let's talk about some of those incentives because, you know, where there's a, a benefit, there's a beneficiary, as they say. So the, what, what are the benefits of planting native forests? and I suppose the challenge, we, we might come back to, to um, Adele in a minute, but James, I want to explore the commercial potential from a timber point of view, you know, timber values, as they say, of native forest uh, would seem, if you looked at uh, some of the, well, certainly the history of, of uh, New Zealand timber is that it makes quite good butter boxes, for instance. Uh, it certainly is a beautiful hardwood, and we know that the Totra um, experiment in the north of in Northland, I think, is is really throwing up, or it, it's, it's demonstrating that you can fetch a very high price for Totra logs. Uh, that was all a long way of saying, James. What a what has to happen for a native forest to be turned into a commercial timber forest? Uh, yeah, that's a big question. Um, I, but I think the overall thing here is that uh, most professional foresters won't be planting native forests because um, they're, they're, uh, there's no return on them from a timber perspective at this stage, um, mainly because consumers don't want us to harvest them, which I understand. However, saying that, there are some fantastic native timbers. Um, and maybe this is a discussion that we need to start having again. Um, and I, it is very possible for us to sustainably harvest native timbers um, with, with canopy closure all the time um, and to do it in, the good, in a good fashion. But no one's going to invest in that without knowing that they can harvest at the end. There are blocks of um, native that has been planted. I'm thinking of a particular block up in North London and Cowrie that the owner is too scared to harvest because they're scared about what the result's going to be, um, you know, in terms of the, what the public will say. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's the, big, that's the beginning of the conversation that has to be had. Um, in regards to your question about but, butter boxes, no, we've got, we can do far better than that. I mean, it's like saying that radiata is only going into boxing. Yes, it does, but some of it goes into other stuff. We've got much, we have some beautiful timbers. And if you have a look at what, Tasmania is doing in their furniture making with some of their native timbers. It's just incredible. Um, and we need to start going down those lines. We need to start looking at it and going, what, um, you know, how, how can we increase the value of what we are producing? Because we are basically, and some foresters are going to kill me for this, are producing a commodity. But how can we increase that by going into other species not to end and, and grow them for longer? And grow and and it will, our harvesting costs will be more expensive because we'll be doing it sustainably. But it's possible to be done, definitely. But, um, but what I'm hearing from you is, you know, realistically now, as a forester, you know, wearing your commercial hat as a businessman, you're saying that native forests are too challenging to um, to the incentives just aren't there for foresters to be planting at, with a view to harvesting. Uh, I'd, I'd, I mean, it's. It's possible, but we won't do it because only, I mean, we're not even sure whether the market will be there, but also we're talking about 30 to 100 um, governments that we have to go through in terms of three-year terms, and we don't know <laughs> if the rules are going to change. And right now, we basically can't harvest native forestry anyway. So um, we would, be, it would be... It would be a big gamble to be putting a whole lot of money into native forests with the assumption that you're going to harvest it. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean you can't put it in with the assumption that you're going to get some cash flow out of carbon or other recreation or biodiversity. There's other things that we're looking at. But ultimately, if you really want to make it um, 
if you really want us to increase the, the area that we're planting, have it, we have to be able to use the timber. Um, and you know, there's parts of our native estate that currently exist that we should be looking at using the timber as well because it's actually degrading in this in with the animals that are in there, and they and even Doc can't look after it. So we've got to look at a different way of financing our native forest. Full stop. David, you uh, without casting aspersions, you're probably old enough to remember uh, the harvesting of native forest. Uh, do you agree that it's politically unsustainable? to be harvesting native timber? And, and could you imagine a time when a sustainable uh, native forestry industry might return to New Zealand? Yes, I am old enough to remember. The skidders are pretty bloody horrible in, West, in the West Coast back in the, um, in the 80s. But I think you know, that, that's actually missing the point. The, the point is we're talking about new forests here. We're talking about forests that have established or are being established today or have established on former farmland, for example, taking the Totoro case in Northland. We're not talking about harvesting or managing old growth forests. We're talking mm -hmm. about managing new forests, new plantations. And, and I think we, we do need to start being a little bit more um, uh, broader in our thinking. And, and, and I know that the, the fears that James talked about um, are, are real fears. And, and you know, there's a really active program in Northland at the moment. Paul Quinland is, is, is doing some marvelous stuff around Totara, yet um, the councils are, are, are under a lot of pressure from some of the NGOs to, to make any harvesting of those forests. These are forests that have regenerated naturally on pasture to make even even the sustainable harvesting of those forests, something that requires resource consent and open for, mm -hmm. for submissions. And that, that seems kind of crazy to me because, mm -hmm. because in Northland, if I was a farmer and I had a bit of totara, um, there's nothing that stops me grazing that totara, putting my cattle into it and, and basically buggering it. Um, yet if I get a sustainable management plan or a sustainable management permit from MPI, which I have to have before I harvest it, that requires me to fence it off. It requires me to do weed and pest control. Um, and I'm only allowed to take out a single tree or, or, or a small group of trees at a time. I've got to have a continuous forest canopy. So I think we need to you know, and unfortunately, there are a number of us around still who remember Faranaki. We remember the West Coast. You know, we remember Puriora, the things that happened back then, which were absolutely bloody terrible. And look, I don't mind saying it. I work in a forestry school. But what the New Zealand Forest Service did at the end there was just downright terrible. And I think it's created a legacy that's still running through the environmental movement in New Zealand today. And I think it's a real tragedy because... I think if we're to get farmers, and we're talking about farmers here, a lot of us, to look after native forests, to establish new native forests, there's, there's got to be opportunities to get some income. Now, some of it's going to be carbon for sure. Some of it's going to be honey. But I think, why not timber? It's got to be under a, a management plan or a management permit with the MPI. We're not talking about what happened 30 years ago. We're talking about totally different type of forestry. It's, it's time we grew up as a nation. Mm. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep quiet now. Uh, I get quite that, passionate about this. <laughs> that, that was a very passionate rant. Well done. Um, <laughs> Adele, I know that you have been exploring the idea of um, rewarding people for biodiversity rather than just planting trees and, and say, collecting carbon. Um, can you expand or exp tell us about what, what a biodiversity credit or something similar might look like? Yeah, so what, one of the challenges that, that we are looking at is how do we increase um, uh, native forestry and, and how do we create a commercial um, market around this in the absence of everything that David's just been talking about, which should exist, right? So I, you know, it's a terrible shame that native forestry was, um, was, wasn't managed well and so we are now you know New Zealand is great at creating these boom and bust industries and we yeah. now are in these posi this position where we can't use our native forestry because we're not trusted to manage it well where are there there are lots of ways of, of doing it and it's totally crazy that we are importing American oak to go into our houses when we have beautiful beautiful timber and anyone who's got an old villa will appreciate their old timber but anyway um, you know we need to bring some commercial element into it if we're going to encourage native forestry there has to be some kind of benefit and a commercial benefit to it. So this is what we've been looking at um, as part of, you know, my challenge of getting uh, funding into, uh, into trees that count. And I talk to commercial organizations all the time who say, oh, look, we, we want uh, NZUs or ETS credits. We want some kind of, you know, return on that investment. And um, 
so I, I look at this and say, well, but so that that then gives us pine, but we actually need native forestry. So what are all of these benefits that native forestry brings and how do we monetize that? So it is all of these things, these are cultural benefits. There's the bird life, there is honey and bees and all of these elements that um, are so important to our biodiversity and, and what make us, uh, you know, you know um, an attractive country and it's so very unique. You know, it's our natural capital. Um, it's why tourists come here, really, mm -hmm. generally for our outdoor experiences that we bring. So how do we commercialize those types of things? So really it's about having a measurement on that, that biodiversity and being able to prove that an investment in native forest has been able to bring that about. Well, at least one of the incentives that we know exists is around compliance for riparian planting, for instance. Have you found that there is an uptake and in interest in trees that count from farmers who are, 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 you know, needing to plant out their waterways? Yeah, totally. Look, we work with loads of farmers. Um, a lot of our trees go into to farm land, um, and I'm greatly encouraged about how farmers uh, want to contribute and um, and recognise uh, where they can can make their can improve things on their land. Um, and I, you know, we've got a lot of work to do there, and I'm, I'm, I have some very encouraging conversations with all the co-ops and uh, and the likes of federated farmers, um, where uh, not only is there kind of the finance might be a barrier, but there's also knowledge, um, as has been kind of hinted at uh, in this conversation. Uh, every piece of land is very unique. It's one of our challenges, but it's also, it's also one of the things that makes us special. Yeah. Um, but every farm and every catchment area has its own unique uh, set of challenges. Uh, so we need to go in there and, and say, well, these are these are the, um, the types of plants that, uh, that you need to have on your land, and it will do all of this. And if you have it in this catchment area, then this is uh, what we think will be the benefits, and this is what we can measure. Um, there, there's also, um, you know, the water cleaning and uh, um, all of those those value add type of um, yeah. types of attributes that we can bring. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, I wonder if we could just talk about urban forests for a moment. Um, you know, the um, I, I was talking to um, uh, someone from uh, a city council recently talked about um, shrub herbs rather than suburbs and uh, the potential for us as residents to be planting natives. David, is that is that a realistic expectation that, you know, we could somehow affect our culture so that, I don't know, in the same way that we now all recycle our, our you know, our plastics, mm -hmm. could we create a, a movement that everyone plants, um, you know, if they've got land, otherwise they just need to give some money to Adele. But, you know, <laughs> can, can we turn our shrub herbs into, I can't think of the word, tree-lined. Yeah, tree, tree-lined suburbs, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm probably the, the wrong person to ask because my, my garden, I think the only, we've only got three exotic um, woody plants in my garden, an apricot, a cherry, and a daphne. Otherwise, everything is native. I've got a mountain beach here that I planted 20-odd years ago that's now 15 metres tall. So, you know, you can do it. And that's in Christchurch. You know, you, you can do it. You, you can bring the stuff back. Look, again, it comes down to what, what are you trying to achieve out of it? Of course, we're never going to create a, a natural system in a city, but we can bring trees into cities. We can bring food sources in and we can bring the birds in. So even in Christchurch, which is one of our most biodiverse vast cities in New Zealand. We've got billboards gradually spreading out across the city. Um, so we can do that. But I think at the same time, let's not forget the value that exotic trees can provide as well, particularly in urban settings, because people like them. The Garden City Christchurch is all about the Englishness. But some of those exotic trees can also be really important. So, so eucalypts are a really good nectar source for Korimako and Tui and that. Um, you know, fruit trees are really good for Kateru. So, you know, it's about being balanced. But absolutely, we, we, we can bring natives back. And there's, look, there's some wonderful people. I mean, Colin Merck down here, um, people around our urban centres who have been, you know, arguing for more native trees and, and native vegetation in our cities for years. And I think we are seeing some really impressive changes. Mm. Um, it's some great questions popping up on our chat. And um, I have one here for you, um, 
James, it's uh, from Dayman Salmon. So um, you better be on your game. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's she's saying that you know in Europe um, sustainable um, harvesting of hardwoods and forests leaving the canopy intact is not controversial has been practiced for hundreds probably certainly um, is the current practice uh, what's stopping us in New Zealand from practicing uh, this sort of continuous cover forestry that she's referring to uh, well, I agree with her. It is um, it is common practice over in Europe, and um, uh, it's it, it's a different. There's two things. One, it's different species, so um, they're grown high value species because it's actually more expensive to harvest that way. So they're grown high value species, which our radiata will, will not. We just won't be able to make any money if we do it that way. And two, it's the landfall. So we've naturally forestry initially got pushed into the back blocks of steep country. And it's actually quite difficult to get machines onto those sites, though we are technologies changing, as David has mentioned, um, to do the sustainable harvesting. Um, we've tried helicopter harvesting. It does work in some places, it doesn't in others. So it, it comes back to um, putting this is right tree, right place. If, you, if you're going to do sustainable harvesting, we're not putting it on the steep, highly erodible countryside. Um, and it's got to be higher value species than radiata for that, well, for most exotics at that, but for, the, for that matter. Um, you know, I've, had the, I've had the privilege of seeing some of the sustainable harvesting. Um, I've seen the I had the privilege of seeing them with Duchy of Cornwall and take out um, oak trees that are, you know, that are approaching a thousand years old and they take one down and it's, um, and you wouldn't even know it's disappeared. And it's, it's, it's fantastic and they can make money out of that and they keep on going. So yeah. I'm fully supportive of it in the right place because as we've been talking about all the way through, right? That's just where we put the stuff. The roadblocks to it are, are many fold is what you're saying. There's a, there's a, there's a PR issue. We, we had um, Sheridan Ashford, a young forester on the show last week. And, and she said when she talks about being a forester, some people say uh, treat her like she works for the tobacco industry. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose I suppose it's because people have this sort of uh, uh, idea that if you cut down a single tree, you've contributed in some way to deforestation, and and um, and so that 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 prejudice has to be overcome, doesn't it, David? Yep. I think as well as saying before, I still think you know we we haven't grown up as a country in a sense, and and we we we've got this very strong separation of 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 conservation and from production in New Zealand and we're not very good at mixing the two together and that, that's come out of our history um, and and I think um, there, there's huge opportunities to try and break that down and, and like I said at the start I'm not talking about you know going in and harvesting old growth forest in our national parks but we've got these large areas of regenerating forests that I think we, we have got the technology, but as James said, we do need to develop the markets, but Totara, there's a good market developing for that, or they're working hard on that. And, you know, Paruri, Beach, you know, there's a range of really good tree species that I think if they're looked after properly and managed properly, um, then we, we, we could do that. We just need to shift our mindset a bit around it as well. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Meg Graham who's, who says, I wouldn't support the harvest of native timber until there's a clear tracking system that allows the timber source to be identified. That is from, from uh, you know, where it's come from, uh, eff effectively some sort of, um, you know, transparency through the supply chain. Is that a realistic expectation? Yeah. Can yeah. I answer? I mean, that, that's happening today. I mean, um, you know, already MPI um, have um, sustainable management plans and permits if you want to harvest on your on your on your land, private land. But it's actually the sawmill where, where they do the the checking, and so they they're auditing all the sawmills and they're prosecuting sawmills who are harvesting timber that does not come from a certified forest. So that that tracking is easy. It's happening already, and it's it's very easy to do. Adele, I want yeah. to go back to. Oh, sorry, James, you go. Oh, I was going to say, well, there's there's two major certification programs that are already in place, both in New Zealand PEFC and um, and Forest Stewardship Council, and most people will see the FSC logo on the back of their paper, and that yeah. that's tracked all the way through. Um, mm. It is, yeah, it, it, that's easy to do, um, and it's getting easier with, with, as we uh, again with more technology, and we, we we can follow it all the way through right to the customer, even down to the paper. So, yeah. Adela, a question for you. You you suggested earlier on that if you could double your income, you could double the amount of planting. Um, will you? Let's imagine you were wildly successful and uh, you, the trees that count continues to grow, and let's hope it does. 
could you imagine a situ situation where you would run out of places to plant? No. All right. Well, well that's problem solved. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we really, fixed it. <laughs> yeah, really simple answer. Sorry. Um, uh, no, I, I, no, I wouldn't. You know, we are, um, I'm, we are declining half of the applications that come to us from planters. And I'm in conversations with landowners um, all around the country of, of, you know, many hundreds, if not thousands of hectares. So um, the supply of land is not an issue. What's their motivation? Um, well, uh, what is it? It is a connection to New Zealand. It is an understanding of the biodiversity crisis that we are facing. Uh, it is wanting to do a, a kind of a gut feel of wanting to do the right thing, but not necessarily knowing how to go about doing it. Um, you know, Pine has had a bit of a, um, a bad rap recently and um, uh, because, you know, it hasn't necessarily been well managed or in the right place. So people are looking at that and saying, actually, we want to, we want to see more of natives. And, and there's an increased um, awareness of and love of our native wildlife, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. I mean, that, that's great. So our native wildlife live in our native trees. They provide the habitat and the, the food source for, for our wildlife. Um, so I think there's a, a, a greater awareness and, um, and a connection. And we really saw this last year during lockdown as well. There was um, quite a heightened um, awareness of, of nature because uh, nature came out because we were locked in and people talked about it. And it was, you know, one of the few things that we, that we could all go out, out and enjoy because, you know, that was kind of it. We could go for a walk in our local mm. park. And so we kind of stopped and we looked at nature a little bit more. Uh, so I think all of these things combined are uh, heading towards, actually, we want, we want to protect the things that are true and unique to New Zealand and invest in our, in our natural capital. Mm. Can I just add to that? I mean, there's uh, the, the key question there is, would they have planted it without the help of trees account? Um, and... I don't know what the answer is for some of these people, but there is there is a great need for information to get out there. There's a great need, but also there's a great need for subsidies or for money. Um, you know, a lot of these people, I talk to many farmers who would love to plant more native, but they don't, they don't know where the money's coming. They don't know how to, they can't finance it. So there, uh, and that's something we haven't talked about. I mean, the land itself, yes, there's heaps of land out there, but what type of land and all that, but it's actually, how do we get people to decide to put trees on it? Um, and somehow or other, the policy settings have to change or something has to change to make that happen. I think that's a really good point, James. I mean, I think that it leads into a whole lot more points. So I'll try to get too carried away with them. I mean, I think the thing about providing information, I mean, look, farmers are incredibly busy people. They run businesses and, and they're experts about livestock and pastures. They're not necessarily ecologists. Some, some are, and I mean, you know, but the majority of them aren't. So they need good support. And I know Adam Forbes is going to be on one of the later ones of these um, um Web, web, web things and, and he, he's done a lot of good work as a restoration ambassador doing that doing specifically that next week in fact next week is it right yeah. excellent so he, he can answer that a bit further but i think the other thing around incentives is really important too and i think um you know la landowners again you know pe people look at a farm and say yeah it's worth five million or ten million there must be a lot of money but actually cash flows are often pretty tight in farms and we're looking at you know depending on whose figures you use anything from you know, well, if you use one billion trees figures, what, $3,000 a hectare for native, up to $40,000 a hectare if we get the council to do it. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of money. And, mm. and I think incentives are really important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we know that you don't, you don't get much change out of $20,000 per yeah. hectare. And, you know, and this is why, one of the reasons why we, we're looking at developing the, the biodiversity credit as a, as a thing that has value so that we can attract investment in um, and give farmers that income that, um, that they should be getting from, from having native forestry and giving it a commercial um, emphasis because if, it's, if, if it becomes commercial, then that will attract investment and then we have, we have more of that good behaviour. Uh, so that's, you know, the, we're, we're very keen on not just handing out things, but actually creating a commercial entity around natives. But also, 
trusting the farmers, giving them the confidence from oh. the policymakers that something they set up now won't be taken away from them in the future, I think is really important too. And that's us as a nation growing up. That, that, that issue. Yeah, totally. How many Just governments did you say, James? <laughs> Anything from 10 to 30, maybe more. It's a lot of governments. <laughs> James, I, I've read and uh, I, I stand to be corrected that uh, it's possible for uh, foresters to transition from exotics into natives and and I've particularly heard this in the context of using kind of carbon farming as the as the kind of the commercial driver for that uh, can you explain something about that uh, I'm probably not the most the right person to explain it but um, basically yes it is possible I, I mean you're, you're using the radiata as a nursery crop where most of our native our forest native species like to grow up in as a, in a nursery crop um, and that's I mean gorse has been used to the same the same mix for a nursery crop so is broom that's been talked about and other and other things as well so it is possible to do my it is active management. My concern is if you think you're going to plant to go out there and plant a whole lot of radiata um, and eventually it's all going to fall over and natives going to come up, that may not happen if there's no seed source around. That may not happen if it's been farmed for four or five generations. You know, you, again, it's thinking about the right you know, the right place to do this in. Um, there's, the reason I ask quite... is, uh, sorry, James, there's a good question here from, um, from a listener, uh, Kays Veitman, who... Um, Sounds like a, a real duchy. Uh, he asks, um, one aspect of our marginal lands is that they are generally erosion prone, which is which is uh, true. Uh, what do you think of planting radiata pine? And he's got 750 SPH. So excuse me for being ignorant. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, I don't think it's uh, a measure of velocity. Um, is, it, um, is it conceivable that uh, erosion prone land might transition from uh, um, you know, exotics, radiata pine in particular, and, and then into native forest at some point in the future? It's conceivable, um, but it needs a lot of management, is what I'd say. So 750 is set to part in 750 stems per hectare is what he's saying there. So of radiata pine, what's going to happen to that radiata pine in 100 years' time? Yes, it may it may fall down one by one, or it may all come down as one fell swoop, and we may have Tolica Bay all over again. That's a problem on the roadable land. So let's be let's actually put some thought into what we're doing. Let's not just go out and do that, um, and let's actually say, well, how are we actively going to manage to get rid of that radiata pine if that is the end goal? Um, and maybe you're better off planting less radiata and actually actively planting some native at the same time. Right. So yeah. Mm, interesting, Adele. What you 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 know a bit about science of this, right? About the using exotics as a nursery crop. Uh, well, you know, I'm I'm no scientist, but I, I rely on the advice of um, of Tane's Tree Trust and and our other good friends. And and what I worry about is there are commercial models and quite big businesses that are being set up around. Let's do some carbon farming with um, with radiata pine, and and natives will grow up under. Now, it, it, the science says um, there's a little bit of debate around this um, that, that that just doesn't happen. You know, you won't get that big, lush, healthy forest growing up underneath radiata pine. You might get some ferns and some pungas, but you're probably not going to get those big canopy species growing up. Um, and if you cut down, if you, you know, the occasional pine and, and, and let some light come in, um, what happens is another pine will pop in because it's an, it's a, an invasive weed species. So that's kind of what that species does. Um, and, you know, and in my own experience, if you walk through a pine forest or if you're, you know, mountain biking or running or, or doing anything like that, it's really hard to see how... Um, how, how a, a good healthy native forest can grow under that the pine needles just destroy everything so you know I, I don't know I, I find it hard to to believe just as a you know walking through a pine forest let alone a scientist but I'm, I'm sure David will, will have a view on this. I, I've got lots of thoughts on this as well I mean look I think it's part of the toolkit um, I think it's it will suit some people and and maybe it's fine there I would not want to see it as a major part of the toolkit I think it depends where you are in the landscape. It depends um, where, if there are seed sources or not. 
And I think my, my biggest fear with it is that when the carbon or the, sorry, the economic return from the carbon finishes, the temptation will be to put another crop of radiata there to get a timber return in the future. So personally, I'd plant natives, not bother about it myself. But I could see for some people it might be a, a way they want to go, but not, not my you, cup of tea. You, you would plant natives if you were doing it for conservation values or biodiversity values, if, if that was your decision, um, if that, that was your prime motivation, that would you, you might as well go straight to... To natives. Yep, absolutely. I, I really believe we we've, we've, we know so much about how to do good restoration. Um, it's really just, you know, it's like Adele was saying, you know, more funding, we can plant the trees. And I think it's then about thinking where they go on the landscape and getting that all right. But I, I think, um, look, let's just get, get onto it. It's biodiversity, it's culture. That, that, they're the key, key things we want to try and sustain and enhance here. So let, let's not try and go around a, a circular route to get to it. Let's go straight to it. And, you know, we uh, Can I just James. say one, the one thing about that is that it is a way of funding native forestry, right? So you plant the ra you plant the radiata, you get carbon coming quickly, then you get native forestry coming through. We talked about before how do we fund the planting of native forestry? This is one way of doing it. So um, I wouldn't throw it out at all. Um, I'd say that it's I agree with David. It's areas that you can put it in. And look, I mean, I look at. Um, if for those in Wellington, I look at the, the hillside behind the Prime Minister's house there, that was all radiata. They took the radiata away. It's now growing quite nice native um, and it will continue to grow quite right, nice. So it is possible and it's a way of funding it. Um, Adele, have you yeah. been sneaking up there and planting in the night? <laughs> well, yes, actually, Project Crimson planted many, many rata just there. And the, um, the council have had to take out those pines and the town belts in Wellington. And while we, I live in Wellington, and while um, the, the, um, our, the forefathers uh, were very insightful in, in having these, these areas of the city being um, only for planting, they unfortunately only put uh, a short-lived species in. So the council is now facing um, quite a big problem with all of these pines falling over uh, and and, that, and it's hard to get that, that regeneration, regeneration happening. Um, and my biggest worry about, um, about that is it sounds like it's a really good solution. Uh, you know, yeah, we'll get the carbon value and we'll, we'll plant the pines uh, and we get the carbon value really quickly. And then, yeah, great, we we'll get natives. And so, yeah, look, everyone's happy. Um, I worry that in 30, 40 years time, uh, the future generations will look at us and go, oh my God, you thought that was a good idea? <laughs> You know, and we're just not going to know. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that's my worry is, you know, we're, we're really good at being short-sighted and, and this is a, a long-sighted um, challenge and issue. Uh, it, it's very interesting to me that we've managed to talk for nearly an hour and we haven't once mentioned what is the government's role in this. Uh, usually when you have a discussion with New Zealanders, it all becomes the government's fault. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the government. Uh, James, if you could uh, ask for some policy changes that would help and enhance and reward more native forest being planted, what, what would you ask for? Oh, oh, for me, it's um, what we talked about before. It's actually a, la a change in policy setting so that we can actually sustainably harvest our native trees. Um, but as part of that, also, uh, and they are changing the Resource Management Act, but we need to be able to have mills that can harvest it and produce, um, produce the timber that can then go into the furniture and everything else. So there's a big investment in that milling side of it. And that's, I mean, we'll be asking people to take a big risk on that unless they know. So how you change a policy setting and you lock it down in stone for 100 years, I don't know. But that's, I'm not a politician, that's their job. <laughs> Uh, well, you could ask, um, David. How about you? What's yeah. on, you know, what, what's on your wish list in terms oh, of the look, government? Look, my, my wish list is, is pretty straightforward. Look, we, we've got to break down this this mindset that sees that statute and regulation equals sustainable conservation. We need to move away from a regulatory approach to one that recognises that we're to sustain our biodiversity anywhere in New Zealand on public land or private land. We've got to manage it. Management comes with a cost. And so government's got to move away from this, this blanket sort of regulatory approach, top-down approach, and provide incentives and work with landowners, not, not working against landowners. Just Adele. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's all of government's problem to fix. Um, and certainly not from a financial perspective. I don't, I don't think this should be wholly a burden on the taxpayer. I think there are a number of policy levers that government can pull, and whether that's helping to create an industry around our native wood, um, and it's around accessing finance from other sources. Um, for example, uh, if uh, migrants were coming to New Zealand, would they have to show that they invested in New Zealand in some way? Could a um, proof, you know, biodiversity credit be some proof that they had done this? Uh, what other kind of pools of, of finance could we access? Um, and also I think that, you know, the Forestry Act uh, needs to be changed to provide protection to our current forestry uh, and trees and within our neighbourhoods. Um, and also the ETS needs to be amended to, to um, incentivise and, and protect our, our native forestry. Would that ETS change be possible given that most of the interpretations of the what, what qualifies is internationally set? Uh, so the, in the voluntary sector, yes, absolutely. And most organisations that I talk to um, in New Zealand are all playing within the, the voluntary sector. So they want to do something and they want to have that proof that they've done something good. It's not the compliance because that's actually a very small sector of, of New Zealand businesses. Um, but if you're in the voluntary sector, then that is our domestic policy. So therefore we can do whatever we want to incentivize whatever it is that we want. So we, we do actually have um, the power within the ETS to do that. And, and, and Adele, the I, simplest I, thing, oh, sorry, James. You go. You oh, go. The simplest thing government could do to incentivize farmers is, is to, to allow them to get credits in the domestic market for, for forests that are sequestering carbon that are older than 1990, whether it's old growth forests or, or regenerating forests, it's an incentive to look after them, which is brilliant for biodiversity. It's the best thing possible. I, I agree. There's, the, there are very few protections or incentives to protect. Um, and also there should be an allowance around insetting. James, sorry. James. So what is insetting? Uh, so that is being able to offset on, with on your own land. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say I agree with Adele 100%. I mean, people use the ETS and say, oh, it's, it's a reason why we can't do something. No, it's a domestic policy. We can write it however we like and make it work for New Zealand. And then the, what's happening at the international level is a totally different thing. Um, but we can make it work for New Zealand and, it, and all the points raised about the pre-1990 and everything else, we just need to be looking at that, definitely. In the last uh, 60 seconds we have left, I'm going to um, ask you to give us a very uh, <laughs> quick synopsis of um, answering this question. Do we have enough land to meet the uh, objective of having at a minimum 300,000 hectares of new forest? Uh, and if we do, um, where is it and, and, and when is it gonna happen, James? Uh, yes, we do. And it's not um, our lower class eight land out in the back blocks. It's actually along stream sides, it's across farms, it's everywhere. Um, and it's in the, in, in the urban area as well. Adele. Yes, I would um, repeat um, exactly what James has said. I think our challenge is in the, in, uh, the incentives to get it there. David. Yeah, I agree too. And to me, oh, you're all violently agreeing. Come <laughs> yeah. on. I was just going to say, but it's what's in the planning that's important. It's where they're located in the landscape and it's how they're managed. That's the yeah. most important thing. Excellent. Uh, look, I would really like to thank you uh, three, James, uh, David and Adele, for joining us on uh, today's Kururu. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. Uh, I think we have um, we could be incredibly optimistic uh, about the potential for more planting of natives. It's good to hear that we're not going to run out of space. Uh, what we have to do is fix something else. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us. How, how many have we had, Simon? Hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> he's, not, he's not giving us a number. None of you have committed to numbers tonight. Um, but uh, thanks to our viewers for joining us. Thank you for the questions. Always apologies that I haven't got to all of you, including you, Keith Dark, who asked a very good question, but we didn't get to it. Um, look, I would really like to invite you to next week's discussion. We're uh, uh, focusing next week uh, with Paul Quinlan and Adam Forbes on 
how do you actually plant a native forest? So if you've got some land uh, and you want to know how to do it, uh, this is the show for you. So this would be really aimed at landowners, uh, at farmers, at people in urban environments who want to get started or are really keen on advancing what they've already got. So I look forward to you joining us. Uh, what time do we kick off, Simon? Six. 6.30 on a Tuesday night. Um, the Zoom link, the same Zoom link, I think will work. Is that right? Yeah, the same Zoom link that you've chosen, uh, that you've used tonight. So thank you very much and uh, good night. Oh, and don't forget to follow us. Uh, there's always more, isn't there? Um, do follow us on social media um, and visit our website, pureadvantage.org. To, to oh, there's the film as well. It goes on and on. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for joining us and um, I don't know, good night.